A very warm welcome to our service this morning on the 17th of March, 2024. We are continuing our Lent series, looking at approaching the cross. And today, the topic is the hour has come. Based on our reading from John chapter 12, verses 19 to 34. But before we start, let's turn to our welcome, our call to worship. And this morning it's taken from Psalms chapter 24, verse 9 and 10. And there we read, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, lift them up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is he, this King of glory? The Lord Almighty, he is the King of glory. And our opening prayer. Lord, King of glory, we come into your awesome presence to offer you the praise of our lips and the love in our hearts. You call us to this place to be your holy people. And so we join together to praise your name for the joy of your created world for our redemption in Christ our Lord, and for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Gracious Lord, fill this place with your presence and our lives with your glory. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We say the words of the confession together. God of mercy and love, we come before you in need of forgiveness. We have sinned against you in not loving you with our whole heart, in not serving you with all our strength, in not loving our neighbour as ourselves. Forgive us, Lord, that we might be your joyful people once again. In Jesus' name, Amen. God is merciful and kind, slow to anger and abounding in love. Hear his words of pardon. Your sins are forgiven. Receive his gift of forgiveness and be at peace. Amen. Come now to our notices, and I'm sure by the time Sunday comes, there will be other notices I will need to give out. The one that I'm, I've got down is that we need to read the bands of marriage for Daniel David Thor and Holly June Cooper. And that will be for the third time of asking. If any of you know any reason why they may not marry, you should declare it. So we come now to our reading. So as I said, it's taken from John chapter 12, verses 19 to 34. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honour the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it 
had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said this voice was for your benefit, not for mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. The crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And before we start the reflection, Lord, may my words be your words, my thoughts your thoughts. May the message this morning be the message that you want people to hear. May I be the channel of that message this morning. Amen. We continue our theme of approaching the cross, our, our Lent series, as we look at the gospel from John chapter 12. And it contains several uh, memorable phrases. The one I want to start with is, Sir, we want to see Jesus. And this is coming from a, a group of Greeks who are really asking that they want to know who Jesus is and what he is saying to them. They really want to see Jesus, not just visually, not just lifted high as the Noah Richards song puts it. They really wanted to know Jesus deeply, to know what he was about. And it's not clear whether they were Jews from Greece, whether they were Jewish converts from Greece, or just Greek festival followers. Apparently, that was a thing. They are usually taken though to be gentiles and are taken to represent the whole of the gentile world now they may have approached philip as he has a greek name and so perhaps they thought he was more likely to hear them out and to help them see jesus no doubt they had seen jesus's uh, triumphal entry into jerusalem and were drawn to this charismatic man whom the crowds worshipped. They wanted to know more of this man and his teachings. They may have known about Christ raising Lazarus from the dead, which, of, of course, had only recently happened. No wonder they wanted to know more about Jesus. And it's interesting to note that while the Jewish nation was on the lookout for a Messiah, the Greeks did not have that Messiah complex. It was not in their belief system. So their attraction to this possible Jewish Messiah is intriguing. Sir, they say, we want to see Jesus. And as we all know, there is one place above all other places that we must look, and that is to the cross. From these opening verses already we have learned that whilst Christ's teaching were attractive to swathes of the Jewish populace, it was also attractive to Greeks, and by extension to the whole of the non-Jewish world. Hence that line in verse 19, look how the whole world has gone after him. No wonder the Pharisees were afraid of his influence. But it also demonstrates to us that his message and his teaching was not just for the Jewish nation, but for the whole of God's creation. Secondly, this is the final public teaching session, and the message has reached these men from the West, from Greece, which resonates with Christ's birth, which was recognized by wise men traveling from the East, modern-day Iran. Both groups, of course, were Gentiles. So Christ's life is bookended by Gentiles from the East at the start of his life and closed by Gentiles from the West towards the end of his life. And that it covers, therefore, the whole of the world. 
Note Jesus' response to hearing that the Jews wanted to see him. In verse 23, Jesus says, and this is the line that we, we, I've taken the title from, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This seems to indicate that this was a sign to Jesus that his time, his death, his resurrection and ascension had arrived. What had been largely hidden was now about to be brought out into the open for all to see. Jesus talks about his death as being the start of a cycle of planting and rebirth when he talks about the kernel and the wheat. If the seeds are not planted, then there can be no harvest, no manipulation of the seed. Manipulation, no multiplication of the seed. Three weeks ago, Peter Groom preached from Mark chapter 8 when Jesus told his disciples about his forthcoming death, causing the impetuous Peter, the disciple that is not Peter Groom, to rebuke Jesus. After all, as we see in verse 34, the crowd spoke up. We have heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? The expectation of the crowd and of the Jewish people was that the Messiah, when he came, would remain with the people forever. Therefore, the thought is this. How could Jesus be the Messiah if he was going to be killed? But our reading today contains a more positive version, I think, than Mark. It's about growth, it's about expansion, and it's about rebirth. It does also contain similar warning that following Jesus may cost you your earthly life, but in doing so, you will save your eternal life. The reading also allows us to explore the question, why the cross? Why was the cross necessary? I'm just going to take several uh, aspects and, and look at them in turn now. Firstly, I think John goes on to remind us who Jesus is. In verse 27, we see even Jesus is tempted to ask the question, Father, save me from this hour. I think even he was appalled by the violence, the humiliation and the sheer horror of the death he was going to be subject to. But then he agrees that this is the hour that he has come for. This is what he signed up to do. So it is perhaps not too surprising that we too often feel uncomfortable around thoughts of the crucifixion and concentrate on the loving kindness, the miracles, his healing of the sick, the raising of the dead, his role as an example of service as the servant king, his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. In other words, we want to concentrate on the nice bits rather than the inconvenient, horrific bits. But that would be to have Christianity without the cross. And the cross, after all, serves to remind us of our sinfulness, to remind us of the death otherwise due to us for our sinful nature. The cross is there to remind us that this is exactly why Christ came, so that he could be the ultimate sacrifice for our sins, so that we could be reconciled with the Father. Without the cross, therefore, Christ cannot complete his mission. Without the cross, Christ would remain a single wheat of grain. But if he were to die on the cross, then he would bear much fruit as a consequence, and he would be able to reconcile us to the Father. If you look now at verses 28 and 29, we see Christ asking the Father to glorify his name, which he does in a thunderous voice from heaven, reminiscent of the dove and the voice from heaven that comes down after Christ's baptism in the river Jordan by John the Baptist. These two voices from heaven proclaim who Jesus is through, through the Son of Man, 
the Son of God, the Messiah. Christ is glorified through the whole sequence of crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. Christ has a glorified resurrection body, and when he returns, we too will have a new resurrection body and glorified body so that we can serve God as we ought. Jesus does not need a reminder of who he is. He's aware of his origin and his relationship with God. The voice from heaven is for the crowds and for our benefit, demonstrating that through Jesus, God's name has been glorified. One of the other aspects I want to look at is the cross frees us from our sins. It is therefore tempting sometimes to try and have Christianity without the cross. Let's be honest, it's easier to talk to people about the good news than about sin and our need for the cross. But that would be only a partial gospel. We need to see Jesus on the cross. In reality, we need to see Jesus everywhere so that even in our darkest day, we see God's love and Christ's sacrifice shining through. We use the term sacrifice because Christ was the only proxy sacrifice that could restore our relationship with God. No number of bulls, sheep, goats or doves could do that. Only Christ could. Only Christ was the acceptable sacrifice for God for our collective sins. We are unable to free ourselves by our own actions. Not even knowing Jesus' teachings can do that. His teachings do show us how we should live once we have been set free. But the teachings in and of themselves do not give us that freedom. We were held captive by our sins until Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. Martin Luther says the cross sets us free from sin death and the devil. Unless Christ goes to the cross, the fruits of our freedom will not be borne out. In verse 31, we can see that in order to drive out the ruler of this world, Christ must go to the cross, be crucified, resurrected, and ascend to heaven. That is God's chosen mechanism. Also, we can see that the cross brings us into Christ's kingdom. The obvious question then is that if it is the cross that sets us free, what comes after being set free? Because of the cross, we know we belong to Jesus's kingdom. We enter into that kingdom because of the cross or through the cross. We belong to him now. We are part of his kingdom. C.S. Lewis put it this way in his Christian Reflections. There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God and counterclaimed by Satan. In other words, we belong either in Jesus's kingdom or in Satan's kingdom. We either serve God or we serve the sinful desires of Satan. In dying on the cross, Jesus claims us as his own because of the cross. We can cross over the border from Satan's kingdom to the kingdom of, sorry, from Satan's kingdom, that kingdom of sin and death, and into the kingdom of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Also, the cross helps us to bear the fruit of the kingdom. It is through the cross that we are able to bear fruit for the kingdom. For it is through the cross that Jesus sends us the Holy Spirit. And it is through the Holy Spirit that we are able to bear fruit for the, his kingdom. In our reading this morning, we see the concepts of seeds being planted, thus giving rise to greater amounts of grain. Later on in John 15, Jesus talks about being the vine. And there we can read, I am the vine and you are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Christ often uses these agricultural metaphors when 
talking to a very agrarian society, it's probably very appropriate. And it seems they could readily relate to them. These metaphors may be more difficult to grasp in our own urban society with its detachment from the agricultural cycles of planting, pruning and harvesting. He is the vine, we are the branches. In other words, it is through us that he bears fruit. I remember one of the leaders at the church we attended in Bath saying, planting seeds is all you can ever do. If it is of Christ, it will eventually bear fruit. Planting the seed is all we can do. Now that doesn't need to be some grand gesture. It might be as simple as talking to our children or our grandchildren about Jesus. It might be talk, taking our children to church so that the truth about Jesus can be made visible to them. It might be about talking to our neighbours about what we did or what we're planning to do at the weekend, about going to church to worship Jesus. It may be about similar conversations with work colleagues. You might be surprised to find some of your colleagues also are believers, but just don't make it known. Sometimes opening up about Jesus means you have others to share with him with. Sometimes that can be enough of a seed planted so that it will later grow and thrive given the right conditions. It might take years, months, weeks or days. It doesn't matter. Without being shown the message of Jesus, how many people come looking on their own? It seems that Christianity in the workplace is a well-kept secret. Perhaps the bad news stories of people being punished for standing up for Christ doesn't help. We all need to take a stand and try to plant those seeds, nurture those seeds, and wait for the harvest. Note, however, that if we don't plant the seed at all, then we should not expect a harvest. Jesus died to plant that seed of faith in us. While we stay connected to him, we will be fruitful. Recall also the parable of the good and bad seeds in Matthew chapter 13. In the clearest of terms, Jesus tells his disciples what almost every element of the parable represents. The one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seeds are the children of the kingdom. The weeds are the children of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are angels. Again, it's that agricultural metaphor. We are called to plant the seeds of faith in others, just as Jesus planted the seeds of the gospel in each of us. We are called to help plant those seeds of faith in others. And that's not an easy task at times. But we have the helper from God in the Holy Spirit to enable and empower us to that task, to give us the words to speak out. And sometimes all it takes is a willingness to open up the subject and talk about our faith as a natural part of who we are and what we do and what we believe, what makes us tick, what makes us us. Lastly, it's also a call to discipleship. The metaphor of being the vine and the disciples as the branches show the that the disciples will go on to continue to do God's will, even after Christ has gone. This is Christ's call to action for the disciples and for us too. As John goes on to explore in chapter 13, to follow Jesus is the, is the service that Jesus calls us to, to do the work he did, to feed and tend his sheep, to testify to the whole world about Jesus. This is the calling for all who follow Jesus. Now, we started with the Greek asking, Sir, we want to see Jesus. 
the fact that the Greeks were wanting to see Jesus, wanting to know him, triggered the response from Jesus, the recognition that the hour had come. The concerns of the Pharisees looked to have come true. Those seeking Jesus was no longer confined to, to the Jewish people, but included now the whole world. That is, everyone else was asking to see Jesus. The answer to wanting to see Jesus is to start looking at the cross. For it is the cross which brings us new life. The cross and the grave which could not contain Jesus. But it is on the cross where the saviour of the world was hung. That we are freed from sin, death and Satan. It is therefore there that we see God's grace. The answer to the Greeks remains as true today as it was in Jesus' time. If you want to see Jesus, look to the cross. Today we have sung his praises, heard his words, prayed to him, brought him our concerns. We have gathered in his name. We have reminded ourselves that he bought our freedom through his death on the cross. We have reminded ourselves that we belong to him and that we dwell in his kingdom and not in the kingdom of man or Satan. We too are called to be his disciples, so that through us he might bear even more fruit. We have a saviour that has been lifted up and seeks to draw all the world to him. So we close in prayer. Lord, we pray that those who hear your word will respond to your call to discipleship that they will grasp the freedom from sin, death and Satan that you offer us through your sacrifice on the cross, through your resurrection and ascension, that we too might bear much fruit for your kingdom and to the glory of your holy name. Lord, send your Holy Spirit to help us share your word with those around us. Amen. We join together in saying the prayer our Lord and Saviour taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So to our closing prayer and blessing. Lord Jesus, our great shepherd, please guide us and walk with us this coming week, that whatever we face, we may know your presence with us. May our lives be lived wholeheartedly for you. For your glory's sake. Amen. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve and share the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. <laughs>